Now we'll start with today's session. Uh, we'll start with the basic questions and we'll move on uh, discussing about how to take care of the jail and ventilator and find the weaning aspect. So before that, we'll uh, just answer a few questions uh, asked by Vilakshmi ma'am. So regarding selection of mode, so what what mode is the best mode? We have already covered all the uh, what are the different modes and what are the advantages of each mode. What are the best mode? Which can be used for every child. Uh, name one mode which can be used P for any child. Yeah, PSMB mode, sir. PSIMB mode. Why? Why it is in PSIMB mode? Why not BSIMB mode? Why not PCV? Why not BCV? We have BRVC. Any answers, any take for this? Why these many modes are there when ventilators are operating on single principle? Why, why you need this many modes? Why you need this many modes really? Based on patient condition, we can. Condition, even based on patient condition, I won't want to change the change the mode. It's not going to make any difference based on the uh, except very few conditions. For ninety percent of the routine ventilations, you never need to change any mode. If you if you learn one mode and you stick to that one mode, that is enough for us. But you need to monitor. So what is the advantage of color control mode? Prevents barotrauma. Barotrauma we can prevent. Okay. Any other advantages? Less asynchrony. That's a major advantage of color control mode. Okay, the flow is decelerating flow, it will sync with the patient uh, flow. So that's why patient will be comfortable. But in a paralyzed patient, whatever mode, it's not going to make any difference. But in non paralyzed spontaneously breathing patients, PC mode has more um, synchrony than VC mode because the flow is constant in VC mode. But in PC mode, it's it matches, it's like a physiological to the patient. Initially, we'll have high flows, then at the end of inspiration, we have low flows, which is matching to the physiology of the normal inspiration. So that's the major advantages of your PC mode. So what is the advantage of VC mode? Volume prevention. So advantages is you can guarantee the volume. That is the major disadvantage of the PC mode. There, change in the resistance, change in the compliance will change the volume delivered. So that can be prevented by your volume control. But the major disadvantage is asynchronous. Asynchronous. And one more thing is what trauma? Volume trauma. Volume is fixed here. Yes. Better. This is going to change, so it can cause barotrauma. So there are certain advantages, certain disadvantages for each mode. No mode is superior to anyone. But you should know what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages, and you need to choose. Okay, let me print it with this mode, let me choose this mode. So there is no universal answer for this question. So my professors tell me what mode you know well, you ventilate in that mode, that's all. 
So if you are getting alarms in that mode, you should know why you are getting alarms. You should, if chill is not maintaining saturation, you should know how to manage the chill on that mode. What, what press I have to alter, what settings I have to alter. If chill is not maintaining CO2, then you should know what should be altered. That's all. If you know all these things, you can maintain it in any mode. So no mode has any superior qualities, no superior things or other. Everyone has advantage, disadvantages equally. So we combine these two things. Advantages of PC mode, advantages of VC mode. We combined it and we created PRVC mode. So it delivered the flow is in the decelerating pattern with volume guarantee. So you have combined the advantages of both modes. But disadvantage is what the disadvantage of PRC mode? We can't. Spontaneous respiration because it, 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 it is spontaneous breathing, he can alter its water and tidal volume generation. If you want to do 20 percent work, you want to do 30 percent, we keep on changing. So, ventilator will be keep on adjusting to that so it can create a asynchrony. So, that's why PRVC, even though it is has combined advantages of both, you cannot view it in the spontaneous breathing patient. So, it is an initial mode where chill is paralyzed or deeply sedated. If you want to choose one mode, that is PRVC. In a paralyzed or deeply sedated patient where he is not able to generate any tidal volume, stick to PRVC if you don't need another mode. But you should understand what is PRVC well before sticking to that. Now, what are things into manipulate? The manipulation is same in any other mode. You have low oxygenation, what is it going to band plate? Map, sir. Yeah, in map, which is the one which is going to touch first? P. Which patient? Which patient peep? IRDS. Parenchymal. You need to answer it's parenchymal. It's not only IRDS, it is for pneumonia, it is for anything. If it is parenchymal pathology, you have to touch PEEP first to alter map. In case of airway pathology, PIP. PIP. That's all. It, it, it is same for PRVC mode. It is same for PC mode. It is same for VC mode. It is, it's not going to change. Only thing, what are the things you're going to control for the advantage extra you have, that's all that matters. But the manipulation is same. You ventilate in PC mode, VC mode, you're not going to change anything when patient is maintaining. Well, you're going to stick onto that. If it is not maintaining, you're going to change any mode. It's not like that. If I put in volume control mode, it will going to change everything based on the patient thing. It's just going to maintain the tidal volume. That's all. It's not going to change anything there. That's the only advantage you have. So in feather control mode, if child condition is deteriorating, like Chill is having getting secretions or competence is worsening. Chill uh, tidal volumes go down and desaturates. But once it goes down, you should know. Even you should be at the bedside to know that chill condition is worsening. What are the why worsening? It is because of airway secretions or it's because of the worsening lung. So advantage of the PC mode is it can tell you the real time thing. What is the problem with the lung? It is improving. It is worsening. If it's improving, you'll get a higher tidal volumes. If it's worsening, you get a low tidal volume. According to you can manage the settings. But in volume for the disadvantage is it will give buffer time. That buffer time could be one to two hours or it could be 12 hours. Till you, you notice, you come and notice that there is something wrong with the chain. Because you don't need to monitor, come and monitor PAP in volume control mode. If you're able to monitor PAP in volume control, even you can get real time uh, uh, condition of the lung. The main problem is you don't bother, bother about the PAP. You want more number of saturations. You don't look at the things what is happening on the ventilator. So if you if you monitor PAP and volume control, definitely chill will not deteriorate. But you can able to pick up this deterioration of chill when you have increased pressures. So that is the little disadvantage with volume control because it it will have a buffer time. So you you can miss certain uh, mild to blocks or worsening lung condition. So in PRVC. You can combine these two and you can minimize the side effects. But the main side effect, the main disadvantage is you can 
cannot use in spontaneously breathing when chill is generating its own tidal volume some amount of tidal volume and another main disadvantage of volume control mode is you cannot use it in leaks if your ed tube size is smaller than what you put uh, desired to put and your tube is having some crack or something which is causing constant leaks you cannot compensate by volume control you need to change into pressure control because the pressure is going to constantly deliver to the ed tube so if you deliver it to the ed tube to the lungs it can generate the same tidal volume but volume it just going to give the volume in the tubings the same volume can reach the lung or it can dissipate away through the leak so you cannot use volume control in leaks but if you want to use volume control you need to give the volume ahead of the normal tidal volume say you have 50% leak so your inspiratory and expiratory tidal volume difference is 50% still you want to continue in volume control mode so how much tidal volume you need to give initially you are on 60 ml leak is 30 ml so what is the tidal volume you need to give 90 that's all 90 ml so still you can use in volume control but the leak can be variable so that's the confusing factor you need to keep on the bed cell you need to monitor the leak whether it's 30 ml whether the leak is 40 ml leak is 50 ml so you need to keep changing that tidal volume so the one thing i can tell you is there is no universal mode you need to choose that is your preference no one is telling that this mode is better than this mode sir sir if you understand the modes very carefully what are the advantage disadvantages of each mode and what are the problem trouble shooting how to manipulate no mode is superior if you ask me what is your choice sir prvc when chill is deeply sedated once chill become active switch over to either sime pcps or it could be vsime ps it's not going to matter but only thing is you need to know what are the manipulations you need to do when chill is not maintaining or chill is improving that's all and even if you don't want to use prvc i don't understand what is prvc you tell me one mode i want to choose simv pc ps if you use this mode even for paralyzed patient spontaneous breathing patient and completely normal patient like weaning patient that is enough if you put simv pc ps and you paralyze the chill what is the what is the mode it going to act simv pc ps that the mode you selected and you paralyze the chill so now it will work like pressure support mode pressure support mode pressure control support yeah is pressure control pc mode because all the breaths are mandatory here and it will be triggered by ventilator so it is pcv now chill is started initiating breath pressure support spontaneous shedding breath but his rate is not more than the mandatory rate rate is not more than the mandatory rate he is generating only 30 or less than 30 that sir not more than 30 the rate you kept is 30 and he is not generating more than 30 he is generating only less than 30 again it is pcv mode pressure control yeah but there is assisted breaths now yes previously is only control breaths now it is assisted plus or minus control depending on the patient generation now chill is breathing at a rate of 40 50 pressure support sir yeah pressure support will add up but the 30 breaths will get pressure control only the remaining 10 to 20 breaths what extra will get pressure support now it is functioning fully as simv pcps no what you made is you made the rate zero mandate rate zero you are weaning chill is taking more breaths you are weaning your mandate rate you made mandate zero what will work like pressure support every so every breath is supported it will work like cpap ps mode weaning mode i think everyone got what i am talking so it's all depends on what patient doing if you kept on sime pcps and you allow patient to decide what he want to do he want to breathe he don't want to breathe is breathing more he can be so that one mode you can use as an initial mode maintenance mode 
unweeding mode. That one mode is enough. But only thing is you need to sit at the bedside, you need to monitor whether the child is lung is same or lung is worsening, lung is improving. Based on things, you need to adjust your pressures. If you don't want to sit at the bedside, don't use pressure control mode. You can choose either PRV or volume control because you can get some buffer time for you to do the work. But you can sit at the bedside, try to use prayer control mode or initial mode can be PRBC as well. But if you're all people are working in the ICU and you're going to stay there in the ICU, you can always simply use this prayer control mode, either PCV or SME, PCPS, that's up to you. I think I'm clear. Any doubts on selection of mode? There's no single mode which will work for all the patients. And if you learn one mode, if you use it properly, you can use it for all patients. That's how I can tell. You need to compensate for the disadvantages. If you're able to compensate for the disadvantages, SIME, PCPS is enough. The problem in neonates is, neonates, the volumes are very small. That's why there will be a lot of errors in delivering tidal volume. So we prefer further control mode in the neonates. But with the recent advanced ventilators, you can always can go for volume control, volume guarantee because they can going to compensate for the uh, tidal volume. The measurements will be very accurate. Even 0.2 to 0.3 ml they will measure. So that much of the accuracy is there in the newer ventilators. So even in extreme preterms, you can use volume guarantee modes or volume control modes. So now, so there is no difference in anything. Whatever mode you choose, you want to choose, you can use choose what, according to your choice. Whether it is pressure control, volume control, it's not going to make the difference, but you should know what are the, what are the disadvantages. What is the difference between same respirator and increased, increased respiratory rate? You are going to get the PS, what is extra on the mandatory breaths. If you set a rate of 30 and child is breathing at a rate of 40, the first 30 breaths will get the PC. The rest 10 breaths will get the PS and keep the PS always to less than the PC. Never keep it equal to the PC. If you keep it equal to PC, there's no point of uh, you keeping a rate of 30. You can keep increase the rate of 240 also. The main purpose is to decrease the minute ventilation and it will support the child. So always keep the PS less than the PC, at least two less than the PC. So first 30 breaths are mandatory breaths, rest 10 breaths are spontaneous breaths. Spontaneous breaths will get supported by PS, not by PC. That's the main difference. I hope I, I answered the first question, selection of mode. Till any clarifications needed? If no clarification needed, we'll move to the second question. I hope I clarified everything or if people not understand anything, it's okay. We can discuss later on. I'm moving to the second question. So I already told what are the initial settings for mechanical ventilation in children, in infants, toddlers, adolescents, it's going to change. Your item is going to change, rate is going to change, rate should be physiological, PP is around 4 to 7, Pressure support should be less than the PC, PAP depends on the chest rise and the tidal volume, tidal volume will be like around 68 ml per kg. So item will be 1 is to 2 and trigger will be like uh, I told in the bracket it will be like, uh, 5 to 6, uh, 4 to 6. So I think uh, I am clear, I clear on this, but this you need to remember by heart. There's nothing much I can tell here. You need to by heart all these things. So these are the general principles. Initial settings are mechanical ventilation for normal lung is all these things. Now, the question here is, what will be the initial settings for a parenchymal lung? This is it lung. Can anyone answer? Starting with PEEP, rate, what is the P for parenchymal lung? The P for normal lung, what we kept is 3 to 7 here. So we have a uh, 3 year old child with uh, pneumonia. What is the P you are going to select? 7. Yeah, you can choose 8 also. There is nothing harm. Depending on your uh, resistance your, uh, for your bagging, you can easily select what is the P needed for this child. And what is the lung x-ray? X-ray is totally like my thought. Depending on that, you can choose initially, but how to tell this is the peep needed for this child? 
what maneuver you have to do inspiratory holds or p plat huh? that is to determine p plat but what are thing you have to do what are the process to to tell its optimum p stable hemodynamics what is that called step by increasing step by step by increasing, we see so many parameters uh, peep tight peep titration titration so you need to do peep titration to choose peep but initial peep you can choose based on your x ray your back resistance but it, it should not be in the range of 6 or 5 that's what i'm telling you need to select it higher side 7 or 8 is it clear you cannot start at 3 for already pneumonic lung with my layer ds you cannot start at 3 or 4 so you need to choose on higher side that is 7 or 8 so rate same inspiratory time same per support you not going to select initially fio2 you can start at 100% you can rapidly wean trigger same everything same pip again is based on tidal volume and the next question is what the tidal volume you going to select What is the tidal volume we are going to select for pneumonia children or ARDS children? Okay. Forgotten. That the one summary slide I kept for disease specific ventilation. If you read that one summary slide, that is enough for you to manage disease in your lungs. It is higher or lower side? Lower side. Lower. It should be on lower side. So start with six ml per kg. You can go even down to four ml per kg when you are reaching PAP of above thirty. So in pneumonia, the PP is on higher side, tidal volume is on lower side. That's all. That's all. All things are same. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Now you have a problem with the airways, like asthma. So what will your PP? Three to six. No. Three to six, sir. No six. It is low. Three to lower five. side. Three to five. Three to maximum. It can reach five. Very rare instances we cross five. Rate. Rate. Normal physiological rate. Physiological. Low physiological, physiological rate. Higher physiological rate. Supra normal rates. Arm. Low. Asthma, you need to give low, even lower than physiological rates. Don't forget this. The rate in asthma is low, low, low. That's all. Inspiratory time. Low high expiratory. Yeah. yeah, it's lower side. Inspiratory time should be lower side. High ratio should be more than one is to two. It's never one is to two. You can go to one is to three, one is to four. So rest of all are same. They are not going to change much. The main thing is you need to allow the spontaneous breathing. So change to decide how much inspiratory, how much expiratory. Let him decide, not you decide. Is it clear? I answered the question for what are the initial settings for disease in lungs. Any doubt still now? The first question is selection of mode. I think I I answered that question. The next question is. What are the initial settings for disease in lungs? Initial settings is based on your rough rough estimate, but the final settings is based on your PEEP titration, oxygenation, ventilation. So you can choose initial settings like this, but everything should be manipulated based on your oxygenation, ventilation. There is no universal settings for any lung. It depends on the underlying lung condition, which is the moderate, severe, intensity. Damage is there. Depending on that, you need to modify your. There is no cutoffs for anything except for P P A P and P plateau. That the only pressures which can can have cutoffs. The stuff all doesn't have any cutoff. You need to modify and manipulate them based on your O2 and CO2. If you are able to understand this one point, the ventilation will be easier. I have seen many people. No, no, you should not cross P of ten. No, there is no cutoff for P. We can go to up to twenty also. If in peep titration, 
you are able to get your compliance better at 20, saturation better at 20 with less hemodynamic effects, even you can keep 20. The maximum P5 and is 24. We don't have HFOB at that time. But when I have HFOB now, I'm not crossing beyond 16 or 14. I'll switch over to HFOB. But if you don't have HFOB, if child is not maintaining saturations, and if you're able to recruit the lung, you can go up to 18, 20, and even beyond that, if child, if my criteria for peep titration is satisfied. So don't think, because you are needing that much peep means your lungs are that stiff. You are not going to cause pneumothorax when your lungs are that stiff. That will be dissipated. But you have to make sure that you are not over distending the lung. If you over distend the lung with too much peep, which is not needed, then you are going to bust the lung. But if that peep is needed for that child, it is not going to cause harm. It is going to benefit the child. Is it clear? So you need to ventilate the yes, between the two. One is the LIP and the uh, uh, second one is DIP. So you need to you need to see where, where the points are. And you should not cause over distension. If you are over distending, then you can cause trauma. But if you are not over distending, then it will not be going to cause pneumothorax. So don't worry about how much of the PEEP you kept. But if the PEEP is needed for the child, keep it. Any doubts in this second question? What are the initial settings for diseased lungs? So we talked about it's a normal lung. Same will apply for diseased lungs with little manipulations in peep, rate, and tidal volumes. So I'll move on to the next thing. Cuffed versus uncuffed it do. What is your preference? Cuffed or uncuffed? Yes, What is your preference? Cuffed versus uncuffed use? Uncuffed tube. Why? Due to small airways, it may cause necrosis and edema. Okay. So uncuffed tubes will never cause this. Is there Less evidence, for that? evidence for that? Less chance. So uh, my arrow mark is visible? Yes, sir. Uh, can you read this point? What is the percentage difference between cuffed and cuffed? See here. Yes. Cuffed uh, 2.4 to 4.4. Uncuffed 3 to 3. What is the difference here? Similar incidence of severe injury. That is what the guide uh, study is telling now. Mm, so your answer is wrong. Next. What are the disadvantages of uncuffed tube? It may disappear. Micro aspirations can happen. Yeah, micro aspirations, tube leak, and more chance for self extubation. Your tubes can migrate. It's, it's not that a tube come out. It, it can migrate from the larynx to the esophagus. When child is coughing or child is moving excessively the neck, it can get displaced easily. So the major disadvantage is chances for reintubation is very, very high with uncoupled tubes. So we think that they are more safer, but according to the studies, they are as equal uh, they can cause injury to the airway, but the more chances of reintubation, during reintubation, the more chance for injury. And the advantage of cupboard is it can prevent micro aspiration, less chance for VAP, less leakage. But if you're using cupboard tube, you should use pressure monitoring until, unless you don't uh, monitor the pressure, don't use the cupboard. So without pressure monitor, if you use cupboard, it can cause tissue necrosis by decreasing the blood supply to the localized area. If you put so much pressure on the tracheal mucosa, the blood supply to the mucosa will be decreased. 
it can cause ischemia and damage. Once it is a healing, it causes subglottic stenosis. Gone. So, if you are using cuff foot tubes, you need to monitor the pressure. There are cuff pressure manometers easily available. You need to just monitor and you need to keep the pressure at 20 to 25. Sir, we are working in a very poor place. We don't have these manometers. So, how I can check this pressure is enough for this cuff? Is there other method? Cost effective method. Even I cannot spare 10,000. So, is there another way? Is there a way, but it is not ideal way. You can easily spend 10,000 from your pocket. If you have 10 pages, even one put for 10,000 or 1,000 rupees, you can easily get it. So, there's no, uh, like, it, it, it's not, I, our hospital cannot get it. it. It's not like that. You can get it. So, for the benefit of larger amount of children, you can you can spare 1,000 rupees from your pocket. That's, that's not a wrong thing. If you don't have that thing and you are not ventilating that many children, what I can do suggest is minimal occlusive volume. You need to put the children on the ventilator. You see the volume curve, volume scalar. Once you don't inflate the cuff, you can, what you get in the volume scalar? What are you going to get when you don't inflate the cuff? If there is a leak. Uh, do not reach baseline. Yes. Yeah. So then you start inflating the cuff. 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Volume. What I'm talking is volume. So what is going to happen in that graph? What change you can see in the graph by inflating the cuff? By decreasing the leak? What when you not get to touch the baseline? It's come and touch the baseline. Why is the confusion there? So the minimal amount of the volume which is needed to make the volume graph touch the baseline is the minimal occlusive volume. Even you can accept 10% leak, no problem, to be on safer side. Is it clear? Any confusion here? Put on volume control, start inflating the cup by 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and see for the graph touching the baseline. Once it touches the baseline, that is the minimal volume needed, that is the minimal occlusive volume. Even you can accept little amount of leak to be on safer side. This is a rough way, but I cannot watch for you that with this method, your pressure is in the desired range of 20 25. It can be even higher also. But if you don't have anything, at least this thing you can practice. But ideal thing is get a manometer. I'm going to show the what the manometer, you can get that. And only disturb in the cuff tube is you need to put the 0.5 mm small size tube than the uncoupled tube. That's why you can have a little higher resistance, but you can easily compensate it by pressures. No need to worry about that. The resistance you can overcome by increasing the pressure, that's all. So that is the only disadvantage, and you can easily compensate it for that. So now you choose what tube I need to use. Coupled or uncoupled? Cuffed. Cuffed. So now the all the units are moving towards coupled even in units. You can get even three coupled two per unit. You can easily put for extreme it's not available below three. Maybe in the future they can get it for that also. Even in neonates, they are using coupled tubes because of these are advantages. And one thing when you are make sure that when using coupled tube is you need to monitor pressure. If you're not monitoring pressure, please avoid it. At least in younger, younger children. So I hope I answered the question. Is it clear for everyone? Can you move on? Yes, sir. So these are the different manometers available. This is too costly. This is around cost of 40,000. No need. And this is the one disposable ones available. And this, this shows the reading here. You can inflate the cuff with this syringe itself. Once you inflate the cuff with this syringe, the value pressure will be shown here. So you can easily get the pressure here and you can deflate it if you want to decrease the pressure. 
it will it will cost around eight thousand to six thousand, and you can use it for test of fifty times. So if you have this, it's enough. But if you want to, don't want to spend continuously, even though it's costly, get it. This costs around forty to fifty thousand. If your if you if you're not if your ventilation rate is not too much, then it, this will suffice. But if you're frequently ventilating, I think ideal thing is you need to go for this. So next important question is humidification. Humidification is very much important in pediatric children. There is no uh, exception for this. You need to humidify because you are bypassing the upper airways where the generally uh, your temperature will increase to 37 and humidification will be happening. That will be bypassing because you directly put the tube in the larynx. You need to humidify and you need to increase the temperature to the body temperature. The two types of humidification is active humidification and passive humidification. This is the active humidification by temperature uh, uh, coils and this is a chamber which will heat the water here and this water will be uh, uh, moving through the circuit and uh, you have temperature sensors here so they will detect the temperature at the, uh, at the nearest to the 82 and it will tell how much to be heated and they can adjust the humidity as well. Uh, for NIV the temperature you are going to select is around 34 for invasive mechanical ventilation you are going to select the temperature around 37. That's the main difference there, sir. But the mechanism is here. Because in NME, you're going to deliver it to the nose. So the rest of the time from temperature can be maintained by your upper air airway. So invasive mode, you just need to select invasive mode here. It will show two modes, invasive mode, non-invasive mode. The uh, diagram will be there on the ventilator or uh, the button. So you need to shoot that what is the mode you selected, is invasive or non-invasive. The light will uh, that red light will come there. And if you don't have this kind of advanced humidifiers, at least you can use this HME filter. These are, these are heat moist ex exchangers and there are different sizes for infants, children, adult sizes. The main disadvantage is they can easily block it by secretions and they can increase the dead space. If you're in volume control mode, if you don't compensate for this volume, then your generated while uh, delivered tidal volume will be very less than what you set. So that's why you need to compensate for this as well. You need to add the volume for this as well. And the manufacturer will give the volume what, how much they can uh, cope, like 21 ml, 50 ml, 150 ml, like that they'll give. And the manufacturer leaflet they can give. So what is the volume they can? So that much amount of thing, you need to compensate by increasing the volumes. And they can easily block. You need to change every 24 hours. You cannot use more than 24 hours. And sometimes the child is having pulmonary edema. Actually, some copious secretion they can easily block it. You need to make sure that if your PAP is going up, your pressures are going up, then you need to change this one. And it is not recommended for NIV. You cannot use these filters for NIV. So that is about humidification. Next thing about sedation analysis, you need to use certain scores. One of the most important uh, simple score is Ramsey sedation scale. And the drugs I already, I already last time we discussed it. OPRs are the most important, consecutively used. Now dexmedovin coming up. So endotracheal suctioning, indication, visible secretion. There's no routine timing for suctioning. Second hourly, fourth hourly, eighth hourly, tenth hourly. There's, it, it, there's no routine time for that. If you see secretions, do the suction. Or if you feel the chelis sign into the work of breathing, and this is like desaturation, thinking of secretions, you do suction and you curve. I already shown you in the graphs you are seeing sawtooth pattern then you need to do the suction or you can have individual pressures your pressures are gone up then you need to do the suction two types of suction one is closed suction one is open suction closed suction mainly for ARDS lungs to prevent de equipment open suction generally what we do and you need to restrict the pressure to 80 to 120 that is the maximum allowed pressure is 120 you cannot go beyond. If you remember 100, that is enough. The vacuum pressure should be set at 100, not more than that. It can cause trauma. So there is a maximum pressure you can allow. So other important thing is eye care and skin care. Never forget that it is not that I am ventilating, I am saving this child. 
if you don't properly give eye care and skin care to sedated children if eyes are gone if the child survives from your uh, bad ards they are going to sue you in the court you are going to face the penalty so never ever if a child get a bad bed sore because of your ventilation that's all so even if you save that child they are not going to listen to you so eye care and skin care is very important don't forget that so use lubricant eye drops close the eyes properly examine the eyes in every shift and look for the uh, uh, position change if you able to shift the child is a second hourly or fourth hourly sweater so depending on the scoring there are lot of scorings are available lot of brad and scale so glamorgan scale is available you can download it from the net so depending on the cvrt of the underlying uh, uh, risk for uh, your bed sore you need to keep changing them putting in a, a water bed or air bed so these are all things you can do for preventing skin uh, sores and early enteral nutrition don't delay any child who is fit to take feed don't delay enteral nutrition at least you can give ng feeds so once the the moment you put the eg tube you can start feeding it's no harm in starting feeding once you put the child on ventilator you need to start feeds immediately don't delay that's the one thing i can suggest and the next question is about aerosol delivery so there are different uh, types of aerosol delivery techniques are available one is pressurized mdis the what the what routinely use mdis the same thing can be used for delivering through ventilator how i will show you and your normal nebulizer what you are going to use for routine nebulization you are in a uh, uh, routine practice that can be used and the other thing is vibrating mesh nebulizer is one extra advantages uh, nebulizers which can be used for ventilators so just remember these two things mdis routine jet nebulizer and vibrating mesh nebulizer especially for ventilators and the placement of nebulizer is you need to keep on the inspiratory leave not on expiratory leave the vent nebulizer should be placed on inspiratory leave at least 15 cm away from the ed tube that is the recommendation why there are lot of theories are there lot of studies are there i'm not going to discuss that just remember this one point you need to place the nebulizer in the inspiratory leave 15 cm away from the ed tube just remember one this one point and when you are nebulizing you need to give longer inspiratory times and slower inspiratory flows to maximize the aerosol delivery and try to choose pc mode than vc mode when you are giving nebulization these are two basic points you need to remember longer eye time slow flows pc mode better than vc mode so this is the two basic things for using nebulizer so this is what the normal uh, routine nebulizer you are going to use this extra fitting this extra fitting it is available so they there you can easily get it from the ramson swans itself so you need to ask them uh, like uh, uh, for a ventilator uh, uh, nebulization so this is a routine thing what routine you use till that this is only extra fitting extra to so depending on the circuit you have you can in another circuit they can directly fit it for pd at a circuit you need to do some kind of adjustments so with this you can just connect it at the uh, inspiratory limb away from the ed tube 15 cm away from the ed tube and these are the mdis the normal mdi what you are going to use routinely you can use it but you need to get an adaptable chamber like this spacer these are the spacers for mechanical ventilation to deliver uh, nebulizations to the mechanical ventilation aerosols and this is one thing you need to get extra for your ventilator so uh, specialized chambers for uh, giving mdis through uh, ventilator tubings so the different uh, things are available you can choose that but this is a cheaper option very cheaper this, this cost around 350 only that's all so this is a routine thing what you are going to use for uh, jet nebulizer compression nebulizer and this is the extra fitting you need to get extra uh, tube so if you get this around it will cost around 350 rupees you can easily use uh, for we are using this only we don't have this kind of mdi uh, this is too costly thing you need to dispose for every patient you cannot use it for routinely you need to dispose the chambers for every patient and vibrating mesh nebulizer is cost it cost around 1 and 1/2 lakh and you need to keep et going for every child and they, they don't last longer uh, with et was the membrane going to get damaged and they can get damaged so you need to uh, 
keep changing them. They are more more efficient. The best nebulizer for ventilated children is vibrating mesh nebulizer. The only disadvantage is too costly, not needed. If you have this setup, in, if you get this setup, that is enough for us. So this is about aerosol delivery. And how to prevent VAP? So these are things, there are checklists for VAP. Head and elevation, mouth care, ET suctioning, forearm suctioning. So these are the sedation holiday, readiness for extubation. You need to keep assessing child. Every day you need to assess the, I can extubate this child or not. And every day you need to stop the sedation and you need to uh, give sedation holiday. And oral care, these are the guidelines for oral care, less than one year neonates. Just you can use normal saline or for neonates you can use the mother's milk itself. And you need to just wipe them with the moist cloth. And for infants and children without teeth, you can uh, smear the toothpaste. Just with the toothpaste, you can smear on the uh, gums. You can wash them off. You can do it every 12th hourly and 2 to 4th hourly, you can just use the style uh, water washings. And children with teeth, you can brush them. You can use the normal brush. Take the brush, apply the toothpaste, and uh, you can brush them every 12th hourly. Along with that, that extra thing you need to use is 1% chlorexidine. It will be available in Listerine washes. The normal mouthwash you can use, that Listerine mouthwash you use for, that can be applied and you need to suction it. You just put it on the thing and you need to take a gauze piece and you need to uh, routinely wipe the mouth. Entire mouth should be wiped. And you need to suction out what are the remaining things are there. And every two to four hour you can use that sterile water and with the normal uh, gauze pieces you can wipe the mouth. So 12th hourly brushing, 12th hourly chlorexidine mouthwash and 2 to 4th hourly wiping the moral mucosa with sterile water. So these are the things you need to follow. I'm going to share this, just to go, to go and read and follow these things. And we came to uh, uh, ending how to wean the ventilator. So every day you need to do the wean screen. What is wean screen is? Whether the primary cause is improved. That's the first thing you should know because you put the child on ventilator because some problem is there. Whether it is ICP, whether you are doing for surgery, whether it is a lung problem, whether it is the airway problem. That should improve. And if you are ventilating for ARDS, your PAFL is more than 50, SPOB should be more than 90, when you win the FFT to 40%. PH should be more than 7.25, hemodynamic stability should be there. Child is able to initiate inspiratory effort, hemoglobin is optimized. Core temperature is optimized, child should be alert. You should not do wean screening. You cannot intubate a child who is not arousable. So this is the wean screen and you should start it at the time of intubation. Your screening for weaning should start at the time of intubation. You need to look for, because the post-op children, you, you can extubate them in half an hour to one hour once it is over. So that's why you need to start this wean screen. You keep ticking. The moment you intubate, you need to start wean screen. That's all. So these are the components of wean screen. You need to tick all the components. If you met all the components, the child is ready for weaning or extubation. Next, what you have to do? You pass the, the child pass the wean screen. Now, what you have to assess? Whether the child is fit for extubation or not, how to assess? What is that called? Spontaneous breathing. Yeah, what is spontaneous breathing trial? How you do spontaneous breathing trial? What are the methods of doing spontaneous breathing trial? We can put the child on pressure support, sir, or we can use TP to see if the child is able to maintain by himself. Yeah. So spontaneous breathing trial is you reduce the support or you unsupport the child. And you look for respiratory pattern, gas exchange, hemodynamic stability, and what are the comfort levels. And you need to give at least minimum 30 minutes and up to two hours you can do the SPT. So when you have to make sure the child will tolerate or not, you can prolong it to two hours. But if you pass up to 30 minutes, you can easily extubate the child. 
So it can be T piece. T piece, what is the support you're going to give? What is the support Chell is going to get on T piece? Oxygen, sir. Of other pressures, I'm talking about pressures. Chell, can you get any pressure support on T piece? Zero. The pressure support Chell is going to get on T piece is zero. It will get only oxygen. And in CPAP, it can get PEEP. In PSV, you can get PEEP as well as PS. So you need to choose which patient in newborns, you cannot use TPs because the ED tube is so small that even that can cause more resistance to the children. So at least you need to give a little bit of PSV. At least minimal PSV you need to provide for newborn. You cannot use spontaneous within trial by TPs for a newborn. Little infants and older children, you can use at least CPAP. Older children, adolescents, you can try TPs. This is what only we follow, but it is not hard and fast rule. You can give TPs for even for two-year-old child, one-year-old child, if they tolerate. So, but for newborns, strict no. So there is no respiratory support by TPs. Maximum support is by PSV, CPAP. When you are extubating on higher PSV, you need to support them. You need to support them by NIV. We cannot take away them. So only on TPs and little bit of CPAP, you can extubate them directly to Gumail. But if you are going to provide some amount of PSV, then you need to think whether they need uh, some support of uh, by NIV or not. But in cardiac patients, like the myocarditis, they need some amount of PEEP. That's why it's better to extubate them on NIV rather than directly extubate to roommate. And you can slowly wean. And this is the criteria you need to for assess. Child should not have sweating. There should be no nasal flaring. They should not make the respiratory effort. Should not get tachycardia. No hypotension, no apneas. And laboratory wise, they should not be increasing CO2s. pH should not drop below 7.32. And PAO2 should be maintained above 60. SPO2 should not decline more than 5%. These are the criteria for extubation. So you put on SBT, you're assessing the child, and during assessment, if you found any of these things, you need to abort the SBT, you need to continue the ventilation. Understood? And finally, what are the causes of SBT extubation failure? This is called ABCD approach. There's a problem with airway or compliance till the lung is not better. The brain dysfunction, child can have delirium, child is not, the sensor is not got better, or child is having withdrawal effects because of sedation. In cardiac way, child is having some dysfunction. And respiratory drive is timed out. You have muscle weakness because of your supported fully the child, you're not allowed the child to breathe any point of time during ventilation. Diaphragm will take more rest and it can have developed weakness. And most, most, most important is endocrine and metabolic issues. Low potassium, low magnesium, low phosphorus, poor nutrition, metabolic alkalosis, all will cause failure of your SBT or extubation failure. You need to address these things when your SBT is failing. You should not skip quite. You, if a child is not able to tolerate SBT, you need to assess where is the problem in this A, B, C, D, E. You need to correct them. Again, you do, do SBT up 24 hours. Today morning, 9 o'clock, I done SBT, I failed. So, you need to check what the problem, A, B, C, D, E. You found something, you correct them. Again, tomorrow, you come back and do the SBT again. So, this is the way you need to do routinely. So, wean screen, wean screen positive, do SBT. SBT positive, extubate. SBT, child start tolerated, assess why he failed, A, B, C, D, E. Correct that thing again. Go for one more SBT trial after 24 hours. So that's all. Any questions? I think I answered all the questions, ma'am. Any other questions? Yes, Raven. Thank you very much. Thanks. Can peep alter after load? 
Dr. Raven. Uh, how does PEEP help to reduce afterload? Uh, it is very difficult topic, ma'am. <laughs> uh -huh. it, it, it's transmural pressure. It is the transmural pressure. Uh, the pressure inside and outside the vessels is different when the pressure is uh -huh. outside. So the difference between intra-abdominal pressure and uh, intra-thoracic pressure will create a window and it will decrease the transmural pressure across the aorta. So uh -huh. it decreases the uh, afterload. On After the, same okay, thing, right? what we understood is we can reduce the preload by increasing the peak, but exactly. we could not understand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is the concept of transmural present difference, that's all simple. Okay. So, okay. because of the transmural present difference, it's going to decrease After. the afterload. After, oh, okay, thank you, thank you, right? So, that's why in cardiac patients, when you wean down the probes, they will extubate them, they will fail, they will okay. have worsening hypotension. Uh -huh. So that's why you need to keep them on some amount of inotropes. Okay. You okay. cannot completely win okay. because PEEP is an inotrope. Okay. It's going to decrease the preload, it's going to decrease mm -hmm. the offload. So it will act as an inotrope. So because of the PEEP, you work can maintain the chill without inotropes. But once you take away the PEEP, they will collapse. Mm -hmm. They are trying to collapse. That's why you need to support them till extubation. You need to support them on inotropes. You slowly take off the PEEP by NAV. That's why my unit protocol, if the child is unstable or little, uh, very little unstable also, extubate them to NIV. Or okay. NIV, when the child is spontaneously breathing, the child will have more preload. Mm. But PP is going to adjust for the afterload. Mm -hmm. Then slowly you wean off the PEEP. 7, 6, 5, then you take off the PEEP. Until that time, you keep the inotrope. Don't stop the inotrope. Then okay. you start with the inotrope. That is the way you can get the success and extubation of cardiac children. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, ma'am. Any more questions?